Hello, I'm Robin and welcome to Molten Music Technology. Today, we're looking at the Moog Mavis. Now you may have noticed when they released it uh, about a month ago that there was a tsunami of gooey and lovely videos from gooey and lovely YouTubers all about the gooey and loveliness of the Moog Mavis. Quite an extraordinary little synth, almost half the price of the Mother 32 and yet contains all of that Mooginess that we know and love so dearly. And while I've no doubt that it sounds awesome and lovely within its context, I wondered how it compared to some other similar desktop synths that are also around the place. Because this is an area in which Moog don't normally play. I mean, sure, they did the Verkstatt. The Verkstatt, I've got one of those up here somewhere. Which was great and very much a prelude to the Mother 32. And the Moog Mavis follows a similar vibe. But as I say, it's not a place where they normally play. And I wondered whether it's a place they should be playing. How well does this compare to other similar synths that are knocking about? Things like the Create Audio East Beast I've got over here. Or the Dreadbox Dysmetria I've got sitting over here. I've also got the West Pest. Those are the sort of synthesizers that are knocking around that could really challenge the sort of dominance that Moog is used to within you know, synthesizer arenas. And so the purpose of this video is to put together the Mavis, have a look, see what it does, and then compare it to some of its compatriots, to some of its comrades, to see, is it any good? Is it worth the money? Does it sound nice in comparison to other creative and innovative synthesizers that are out there? And because perhaps I'm gonna be looking to criticize the, the Mavis, I should, already point out that it is a great synthesizer. There are dozens and dozens of YouTube videos out there telling you exactly how awesome this sounds and how fantastic it is. I'm looking at it from a different perspective. I want to find reasons why perhaps it's not all that. And I should also say that Moog have sent this to me in the hope that I'd make a video about it. I don't think they were hoping I was going to make this sort of video, but hey, this is where we are. So we'll kick everything off by putting it together and then plugging it in, see what it sounds like, see how it compares. That's the plan. So Moog call this a kit, right? Because you have to build it yourself. I mean, you know, they've saved themselves half an hour of labor, I suppose, in order to get you to screw the thing together yourself. But it's, it ain't a kit. It's not a kit. Let's not con ourselves into believing it's anything like, is anything like the Dysmetria, which is a complete kit where you have to solder stuff together, components all done in here. All put together yourself, soldering your iron, bish bash bosh, spent an afternoon doing it or two, fantastic. That's a kit. That's a, this isn't a kit. This is a snap together thing. It's like if you're ever into Airfix when you were a kid, there was Airfix that you have to glue your Spitfire together, and there was these other manufacturers where you just had to sort of snap them together, and it was never the same experience. You never felt like you'd built anything. You just snapped, literally snapped something together, and that is what we have here. So by the numbers, we should attach the rubber feet. Super. Secure this PCB to the front panel. PCB, front panel. Job done. <laughs> oh, there's some screws involved. Hang on. Hang on, hang on. Using a screwdriver, carefully secure the five screws on the back. Then mount assembly to chassis, which is this. It has this rather nice lid. Definitely approve of that. That's a fantastic thing to include. So power, okay, comes from there. So that's a good point. That needs to be poking out of the this side here. So I actually had it upside down, so there. Power needs to come out of that bit there. Now this, is a hex nut driver, which is totally brilliant. It's for putting nuts onto, have I got that the right way up? <laughs> onto the patch bay bits. I mean, geez, I've just spent like 350 quid on a, on a synthesizer, you know, you would say. And I've got to sit here and put the whole thing together myself. Cool, gee whiz. I mean, in some ways, if it, if it saves a bit of money, if it means you can get something cheaper, then a little bit of self-assembly, that's fine, 
I think that's a, in fact, in some ways it's a good idea. It does draw you slightly closer into the idea of understanding the technology without actually teaching you anything at all. So it's clever really, but the perception is that I've built a synthesizer. And I, I like that. That's a good perception to have, I think. So there's a clear plastic light pipe that carries light from the LFO rate LED. It must be there. Insert the tapered end into the hole. So the small end then, I assume, goes into there. You push it in and that's not remotely flush. <laughs> Ow, that hurts my finger. So maybe I'll push it in a bit with this. Attach the lid, protective lid, so that you can't play it. Then we can turn it upside down and apply the label here. So right on this, built by Robin. I just missed that brilliantly. Perfect, good, great. So using the included power supply, here we go. Connect it and see where the LFO lights up. Yes, it does. By golly, let's take the lid off. Yeah, it's sitting there staring at me. <laughs> can't believe I can't quite get that in there. Oh, okay, that went in a bit better that time. Good, good. So there we go. That is one built Moog Mavis. Wasn't too strenuous, wasn't too difficult. And now just having a quick look, you've got these weeny little knobs, really, really weeny knobs, a nice patch bay, a little button squidgy keyboard, a bit like the Mother 32. Let's see if we can get some sound out. Ooh, it's going, it's going. So there we have it, a little bit of noise. Now I'm going to bring you in, have a little look at exactly what it is that this offers. Do a bit of patching, make a bit of music, do that sort of thing. I think I'm gonna stop now though, because it is baking hot in here and I am just gonna drip into <laughs> to a melted puddle on the floor. So I think, I think I'll come back to this later. The Moog Mavis then, here we go. Here's, here's the little fella. Now let's just go through some of the basics just to give you an idea of what it is that this does. If you want a really in-depth video of exactly what this is all about with some of the most amazing patches you have ever heard from a single tiny little synthesizer, then go and check out Myla Melody's video. The link I'll put in the description or somewhere, but go and check that out because he gives a phenomenal walkthrough of this little synthesizer, which is not the intention of my video. My video, I just want to show some of the basics, some of the basic ideas, and then make some sounds with it and compare it to some other similar synthesizers. So this appears to be designed as a fun, simple, but complex behind the scenes entry into subtractive analog monophonic synthesis. It has a single oscillator. It has that famous, lovely a Moog 24 dB ladder filter. It's got some modulation, a single envelope, which uses itself on the, both the filter and the VCA, has the ability to drone, and it has this rather interesting wave folder in it too, which you don't tend to find on subtractive synthesizers or on anything that Moog does generally. It's immediately obvious that it doesn't have the finesse or panache of the Mother 32, but then it's not supposed to really. This is a different beast. And it has its own reasons to be, to be cool, to be juicy, to be interesting. So with this button here, I can switch on a drone mode or VCA mode to on, which means it's bypassing the voltage controlled amplifier and just outputting the sound. VCO is here, you've got pitch control. And then you've got a variable wave shape from Sawtooth, which is what we're hearing at the moment, all the way through.
to square, which is that. Back to sawtooth, to square. So that's already interesting. The fact that it's not just got separate waveform outputs, it's got a variable morphing between those two things. It's giving you a whole range of tones. Once you get over to square wave, you've then got the pulse width, which is that delicious movement. All the way down to something quite fine, but it doesn't actually disappear. And that can work with your wave shape to give you a load more variations on tone. Next along the top is the filter just rounds those edges off beautifully do you get a nice little sine wave but of course we like to boost a little bit of resonance with our filter to give us more interesting sounds as you can see it starts to fall apart around the edges which is nice you do also get quite a drop as you turn up the resonance But that is just lovely. If I normalize this display, so we get a, a, a bigger look, but you'll no longer see or visualize the drop, because everything will just be pumped up to 100%. But it just gives you a, a better display. Now that I've explained that there is a bit of a a bit of an audio drop when you pump up that resonance. But otherwise, what a beautiful thing. And there's that point at which it starts to self-oscillate. So this is just raw waveform stuff. There's nothing funny going on. There's no reverb that I'm aware of. It's all just within the oscillator and the filter. It's beautiful. In the next line, you get modulation. Now this is quite interesting, the way that they've decided to do this. You've got kind of a blend between envelope and LFO, and then you've got an amount and then you've got the same on the filter. So this one is controlling the modulation of the pitch. These two here control the filter. And that's all rooted from the single envelope and single LFO. And that ends up being quite effective. We're still in drone mode, so I'm not going to use the envelope at the moment. But if I start bringing in some LFO... You can see that happening. So with the filter here, you have a zero position at 12 o'clock, and then you've got positive and negative, which is more applicable to envelopes really than LFOs. <laughs> Wee 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 w
ERFO will go all the way up to audio rate. And also varies from triangle wave to square wave. I can then direct that to the pitch. With the pitch amount, I'm just widening, widening the, the peak and trough of that square wave LFO. I can make a triangle. Take it up to audio rate. There's a nice FME's type clanginess. Lovely. I'm really enjoying this already. So the other side of this is to switch into envelope mode and then you can essentially play it. Although, I mean, you can, you can change the pitch on the keyboard. In drone mode, no bother. Envelope mode then, <laughs> let's turn that on. And this brings in our ADSR, which is just your, your regular ADSR. Let's just calm everything down a little bit, put everything over to envelope. So you mix on these 
uh, modulation knobs is mixing between the envelope and the LFO. So you can actually have both of them going on if that's what you're after. But otherwise, we're now in invoking the VCA, turning on a gate whenever we press a key. So if I put the filter to zero, so it's no longer being modulated by the envelope, then we can check the envelope out. So you've got everything from very, very clicky. Sustain level. And then release. Have some glide here also. If you bring the filter back in, you can route the envelope to that as well. It's really nice being able to bring in the LFO to the filter. That is really the main synth. I mean, it's great. It sounds lovely. It sounds very Moog-like. It sounds like those sorts of synthesizer sounds that you imagine in your head. It has all of those facilities that you believe you would need. You can do trombones. thing I suppose that, that throws itself up as you play with it and enjoy playing with it is that this keyboard is not awesome in any shape and there's no sequencer so I mean in almost every little synthesizer whether it's everything from a 303 through to anything else you can think of it tends to have just something an arpeggiator a sequencer something that will allow it to make sound. I mean, this, of course, will drone, which is great. But one of the awesome things about exploring a synthesizer is having it play itself so that you can then explore the sounds that are happening. And that, I think, is the, is the biggest thing that's missing from this. And it's a shame. However, if you look at the patch sheet here, it goes, oh, who needs a sequencer? So it's kind of something that Moga are very much aware of, that it's going to be a criticism. But they've provided a patch and they've provided the facilities that kind of pseudo-ish can do it. 
So, but what am I talking about? So it has essentially in here a sample and hold circuit. Sample and hold is when it grabs a value, samples a value, takes that value and outputs it as a voltage. It's a way of generating kind of randomness. Now it uses the VCO in here rather than noise, so it's less random perhaps than, than a standard uh, sample and hold would be. So the sample and hold output is, is here. Now the labeling on these and on the Mother 32 as well, I think is always on, is always above the patch socket which when you're approaching a synthesizer from below as I am here I always get that confused I'm always plugging into the to the wrong hole first so sample and hold to me looks like it's that one that's the one I'm going to plug into but it's not that it's this one it's above it it's this this one this one here sample and hold plug that into the one volt per octave and we should get essentially a sequence I mean you know it's just random voltages being thrown into the pitch. But it gives us something to play with. Yeah, does it? Yeah, no, kind of. I mean, the uh, the patch here actually goes for a few more, for a few more things, just to make this a little bit more together. So I think if we follow it in its entirety. We should get something interesting. So it's actually using a attenuator, which is here, to reduce the range of the sample and hold. So we've got sample and hold, we're plugging it into a mulch so that we can also use it on the filter, but we'll just use it for the moment on the on the pitch. So as I turn this attenuator down, it's reducing the amount of voltage. And so reducing the range of that randomization. The other thing you do is take the output of the LFO, plug that into the gate. So then we've got it triggering notes. We put it on envelope mode. Then it starts to feel like a sequencer. range of values when you move towards the sawtooth because the sawtooth is a continuously variable uh, waveform whereas the square is on and off so when it's on square it's only really sampling a couple of different voltages whereas when you bring it back around here you get a whole load more stuff <laughs> wow. 
So these patch sheets are fantastic. You've got a buzzsaw, the tube dual square, foldable kick drum, folding bass. The idea, of course, is that these are like presets. It just shows you what to do. I mean, it's a perfect thing for someone who's just getting this for the first time and wants an idea of what something might sound like. There are a lot more examples, I believe, on paper, which you can just follow from the manual or the website. But let's have a look at this. So then the wave folder, what's all that about? Well, the wave folder is a separate module within it. It's not normalized to anything else. So you can use the entire synthesizer without it, just without any patching whatsoever. Just play it, play it, and you're away. But if you want to use the wave folder, you have to stick that into the audio chain. So to do that, you take the output of the VCO, plug that into the fold input. <coughs> And that should get us our fold. So let's turn everything else off. square waves isn't anywhere near as much fun because there's nothing really to fold. As you fold a square wave it just ends up being more of a square wave. So you need to be using something more approaching the triangle. Or I guess if you use the filter to bring us back to a sine wave No, that doesn't seem to work. <laughs> I think the reason for that being is that the wave folder interrupts before the filter. So that ain't doing it. So let's not do that. nice would be to have some modulation over the fold. It doesn't appear to be any that I can find. So Mavis is an adorable little synthesizer. It's fantastic. It sounds lovely. It has all that Moog tone. It has an interesting patch bay with different things going on. The way folding is lovely. All of it in a lovely little package with a, a useful little lid and some patch cables and these patch bits. I mean, the whole lot together. You've got the poster, cards, you know, you, you enter into the entire environment of owning a Moog, and that is worth a lot. It is worth a huge amount all by itself. However, if you compare it to some other similar synthesizers, which perhaps are even cheaper, then we find perhaps that its feature set is, is on the light side. So what I'd like to do now is just compare it to a few other uh, bits and pieces just to see how it stacks up against something else. I mean, that's not to take anything away from the sound of this, which is great. Undoubtedly, go and see my Lars video and he will instruct you in how awesome the sound of this is. But there are other options. So let's have a look at that. Thank <laughs> you. 
then it's a bit of a conundrum i mean comparisons are, are difficult sitting two synthesizers side by side and trying to go oh this one sounds better than this one or doesn't sound better than that one is really difficult and i don't know really how helpful that is except to try to demonstrate perhaps the range of what's on offer because the moog mavis beautiful though it is moogy though it is isn't exactly exuding features but then maybe that's not what you want maybe you just want something that is simply moog but then that raises the question about the verkstat here which is very similar i mean you can see how the two are related in fact i mean this one really took us to the mother 32 which has then taken us back to here and it just makes you scratch your head a bit i mean why well because this this is half the price of this and it is price, really, that is driving this video as much as anything else, because there is absolutely no doubt in my mind that the Moog Mavis is a sweet 
neat, gorgeous little synthesizer. Absolutely. It's just far more expensive than other things which do a heck of a lot more. Is that important? I don't know. I mean, that's really, that really is down to you. But let's, let's put the dagger in the heart and just tell you what it is that it doesn't have. And let me do that while I put on some decent knobs because the first thing it has is these crappy knobs on the front. You know, I mean, these things, honestly, they're a pain. I mean, it's like I'm playing with a Korg Volker for which I could get two or three of those for the price of this. Because when you come back to the to the sheer beauty and elegance of the Mother 32, even in its Euro rack form, it just, it doesn't really add up. So it's lovely that it has a wave folder, but something like the West Pest has a dirty great big wave folder in it. It's not even integrated. It's not part of the semi-modular setup. You have to patch it in directly. It's like a separate circuit. And it gives you the impression it has a few controls and it, it doesn't. It just has the one and it's not even CV-able or modulatable. It's just a single fold. It sounds nice. But no one's saying it's not sounding nice. It's just that the, the features available on it are a little on the slim side. It has no sequencer. That's not a huge one, but if this is your first synthesizer, you'd like to have something that would play it. Something that would get notes going, you know, an arpeggiator at the very least. I mean, it's got a keyboard, thank the Lord for that. So at least I have something to play with. But the vast majority of other synthesizers around this price and below have some form of sequencer, some form of arpeggiator, something to help you play. It only has one filter mode. Well, most synths only have one filter mode, to be fair. And this is a particularly beautiful ladder one, the classic Moog one. Although there is quite a bit of drop off when you pump up the resonance. but it is nice, without a doubt. There's no MIDI. MIDI not necessarily important, of course, in a, in a Eurac module, in a little synthesizer, but it does make things easier. I mean, again, most other synthesizers do have a MIDI input or a USB port, one of those just to be able to make it simple to connect it to your computer or simple to connect it to a keyboard. Otherwise, you're going to need a keyboard or sequencer with CV outputs because this doesn't have a sequencer. And so the lack of sequencer is kind of compounded by the lack of MIDI. does have a groovy little modulation matrix, smallest one you could possibly imagine, but it does only have the one LFO and the one envelope. And although it does have some nice mixing between the modulations to both the oscillator and the filter, there's not a lot of it. It does have a decent patch bay, but it's weirdly on a different side to all of their other ones. So when you put it in their 60 HP, three tier, four tier, eight tier thingamajob, all the patch points are on the wrong side. So you're having to stretch cables across itself. Or if you put it into the 104 HP Mo case, then it will sit beautifully next to another 32 or one of their other ones, but then there's no actual room for a power supply. So that doesn't work either. In which case, perhaps it's just supposed to sit alongside. I mean, that can work, but it feels like it was a strange decision to put that there. It's great to have these additional utilities, just a bit of attenuating and mixing. That's a very useful thing when you're using it in a larger context. But there's things like the glide knob here. That doesn't work if you're using CV. So if you're attaching another sequencer, that bit only works with the onboard keyboard, not with CV and gate coming in. There, that's better. Now I know what you're thinking. You're thinking, I've got to have to write in. I can't believe the outrage 
that's going on here. How can this idiot pour such shade and scorn upon such a beautiful Moog synthesizer? Yeah, well, I mean, good question. But as I said at the beginning, there's no wrong with this. This is fabulous. This is fantastic. If you want a Moog synthesizer and you've got 350 quid to spend, then this will do the job nicely. My only real point out of all of this <laughs> endeavour is just to say that there are other synths around this price point that have a heck of a lot more going for them in terms of features. I mean, for a few extra quid, you could get a Dreadbox Nymphus, which is a polyphonic analog synthesizer. You could get something like the Malevolent. You could get a Base Station 2, let alone little synths like the East Beast to West Pest, the Dysmetria, the Sound Object Number 5, or a pair of Werkstats. So while the Moog distortion field is, is great and thick, and fat and weighty. They ain't necessarily the be all and end all of everything. I mean, for me, the pinnacle of what they do in terms of value, in terms of authentic analog sound that's beautifully constructed and presented is the Mother 32. It's been around for ages. They completely and utterly aced this thing. And it's a gorgeous, gorgeous synthesizer. And the way that it builds up with the subharmonicon, the DFAM, it's just a beautiful and brilliant thing. And this, I believe, is where Moog needs to play. This is their playing field, not this. I mean, we don't need, I don't think, we need a cut, cut price Moog synthesizer. Do we? Because they have to make too many compromises. Too many things drop off the side. The sequencer, MIDI, the knobs, you know, the case. The layout, things like this are, you know, have to fall away in order for them to hit their price point because they're a bit more of a boutique manufacturer. I would much rather that they do some more interesting things in the Mother 32 arena, in that place of things and let the cut price manufacturers do the cut price synthesizers because you don't need to play down there. You don't, you don't need to play down there. You can stay high and we will pay for it because we love it and we love what you do. And there's always going to be a massive and solid market for all of those. You don't need to do this. However, if Moog is what you want and you want to get into that at three to four hundred pounds, then the Moog Mavis is beautiful. And it sounds, I think, perhaps best in amongst a load of other stuff. Hope that's been helpful. And in the meantime, go make some tunes. Thank you.